Next on Currents News, an enormous migrant caravan marching toward the U.S. border showing no signs of slowing down. Former Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor revealing she probably has Alzheimer's in a moving personal statement. All that I can say is, thank God, he has done it. Facing long odds, he changed a part of India and the faith now flourishes there. Currents News has the exclusive interview with this heroic Catholic bishop. Plus, the Young People's Summit meeting at the Vatican is in the home stretch. John Allen joins us from Rome with the latest on what's been accomplished. It's a busy day of news, but we've got you covered, and it all starts right now. Thousands of migrants crossing a bridge in Mexico with one destination in mind, the United States. As the caravan of more than 7,000 people moves north, people seeking a place to rest taking over the streets of the Mexican town of Huitzla. Good evening, everyone. I'm Liz Wobles. The Mexican government is under intense pressure from the Trump administration to stem the flow of Central Americans heading for the U.S. Patrick Oppmann reports from Mexico. It is a river of people that heads in only one direction, north. The lucky ride on top of cars or on the sides of them. Mexican police try to stop the caravan of migrants at the border with Guatemala, but were unable to prevent them from crossing the river into Mexico. That's where we first saw eight-year-old Jorge as he struggled to make the swim across. A day later, we find him walking alone. He tells me in a weak voice that he's hoping to cross the border into the U.S., but after more than seven days on the road, he is very tired. After the caravan entered Mexico, federal police set up a roadblock with over 100 officers. They were going to force the migrants to get on buses that would take them to government shelters. There were too many people, more than 7,000 caravan organizers say, so police had to let them through. Mexico, Mexico. These migrants have just entered Mexico. They are going north. They have hundreds of miles to go before they reach their destination, the United States. But they are being shadowed almost every step of the way by police. There's a heavy police presence here. And Mexico has said that they will treat these migrants with dignity. But they've also promised the Trump administration they will not let them get to the U.S.-Mexico border. The Trump administration is threatening to pull aid from countries that fail to prevent migrants from entering the U.S. illegally. But caravan organizers say they won't be bullied. We are going forward. There is no going back, he tells me. We are fighting. Single mother Blanca Lidia crossed the river into Mexico with her three children. The journey north was exhausting, but they would persevere, she said. I have faith, she says, that we will arrive. They will need all their faith and more for the hundreds of miles that still lay ahead of them. Patrick Gottman traveling with the migrant caravan near Tabachula, Mexico. President Trump condemned the caravan at a huge campaign rally late yesterday in Texas. He criticized it as threatening America. That is an assault on our country. That's an assault. And in that caravan, you have some very bad people. You have some very bad people. And we can't let that happen to our country. The president linked the caravan with other hot topics and listed them as reasons to vote Republican on Election Day. This will be the election of the caravan, Kavanaugh, law and order, tax cuts, and common sense. The president was in Houston to stump for Ted Cruz and other GOP candidates. Sad news from retired Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor. She has dementia. O'Connor made history as the first woman ever on the high court when Ronald Reagan selected her in 1981. Now the 88-year-old has revealed her diagnosis in a letter saying it's the beginning stages of dementia and is likely to become Alzheimer's. She wrote, quote, while the final chapter of my life with dementia may be trying, nothing has diminished my gratitude and deep appreciation for the countless blessings of my life. Tonight, an exclusive Currents News report about a heroic Catholic bishop taking over in a place where Jesus Christ was unknown. He changed a part of India. Now the faith flourishes and women are respected. Tim Harfman is here with the story. Tim. 
Liz, in 1980, Bishop George Palay Parambil was jailed in India simply because he was Catholic. Today, despite the long odds he once faced, he's considered a hero, a leader who built a vibrant Catholic diocese from nothing. They realized that to be a Christian was nothing wrong. So they just began to be open about it. Christianity was once banned in the region of India where Bishop George now leads the thriving Catholic Diocese of Miao. Today, 90,000 followers of Christ practice their faith openly. 30 years ago, there was no Catholic presence at all. I could never imagine that even one hundredth of this would take place in this, in this span of time. All that I can say is, thank God, he has done it. He's in the Brooklyn Diocese to visit Aid to the Church in Need, a Catholic organization that supports Christians who are suffering and persecuted around the world because of their faith. Almost single-handedly, the pioneering bishop has transformed life in the northeastern part of India, a tribal area known as the state of Arunachal Pradesh. He's built 32 parishes, including a church that features the tallest statue of Christ in all of Asia. He's opened over 40 Catholic schools in the diocese and constructed the region's only hospital. Some section of the administration was misinformed about Christianity, and so they thought it was something imported. But they realized it is the life of the people. The heroic cleric also dramatically raised the stature of women and girls. We also started telling it's not enough that we educate the boys, the girls also must come up. Slowly the society realized girls are equally smart. Through education, the emancipation of women has transformed tribal society. Women are no longer considered property of their families and are free to choose their own husbands. Everything that we do must be supported by prayer. Not the time, the length of time that we spend in prayer, but the intensity of it. When Benedict XVI created the Miao Diocese in 2005, he selected Bishop George to be its first leader. Despite what's been accomplished, the bishop knows there is much more to do, and he needs the help of the villagers who live there. I always tell them, if these churches and these activities have to go on, we need priests for the future, and they must come from your villages. In addition to faith-building initiatives that have created a dynamic religious community, Bishop George has brought peace to the region, along with a number of clean water projects, efforts that have helped lift the villagers out of poverty. Bishop George says he's on the road visiting churches and parishioners nearly every day. That's because his diocese is spread out over nearly 17,000 square miles. To put that into perspective, the Brooklyn Diocese covers less than 180 square miles. What a great story, Tim. On top of all the groundbreaking things that this bishop has done, he's constructed the region's only hospital. But is it big enough to care for the people in the region? It is. Since it opened nearly two years ago, uh, the infant mortality rate has dropped 80%. Mm. And on top of that, the church staffs the hospital, which was dedicated to St. Uh, Mother Teresa of Calcutta. All right, Tim, thank you. Great story. A major development involving the U.S. bishops and the clerical sex abuse crisis. The bishops will gather for a spiritual retreat set to take place at a seminary in the Archdiocese of Chicago. They're doing so at the invitation of Pope Francis. The bishops will be together for seven days from January 2nd through the 8th as they address the current U.S. clergy sex abuse crisis. Chile's Court of Appeals is denying it's reached a decision in a lawsuit that accused two cardinals, Francisco Erazuriz and Ricardo Ezadi, along with the Santiago Archdiocese, of covering up sexual abuses. Several news reports yesterday said the court ruled in favor of three survivors attacked by Fernando Caradima. He's Chile's most notorious ex-priest. The court says it hasn't voted on the case yet. The Vatican is pressing for more action by the United Nations to better protect refugees and migrants. The world body is expected to adopt a new global agreements soon. The Holy See was active in writing the pacts, but a key church official calls them only a first step, and the UN needs a solid worldwide strategy to put them into practice. The fallout from the killing of a journalist is reverberating across world capitals, and President Trump is sending his top spy, CIA Director Gina Haspel, overseas to get some answers. Kelly Smoot is in Washington with the latest. Our administration 
is determined to use all means at our disposal to get to the bottom of it. In Washington, the Trump administration actively questioning Saudi Arabia's claim that Washington Post journalist Jamal Khashoggi was accidentally killed during a fight at the Saudi consulate in Turkey. I am not satisfied with what I've heard. Sending CIA director Gina Haspel to Turkey to review the investigation and discussing the incident in a meeting between U.S. Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin and Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman Monday. Meanwhile in Turkey, where Khashoggi's killing occurred, authorities continue their investigation and the search for his body. Salman. President Erdogan calling it a, quote, ferocious and premeditated murder, asked for the suspects in the case to be extradited to Turkey. I'm calling on the king of Saudi Arabia and the highest level of the Saudi administration. The incident has occurred in Istanbul, so this team of 15 people should be tried in Istanbul. Saudi Arabia's king and crown prince met with members of Khashoggi's family Tuesday ahead of the start of the Riyadh Future Investment Initiative, known as Davos in the Desert. The investor conference has been overshadowed by Khashoggi's death. Dozens of businesses and government leaders from around the world, including the CEOs of J.P. Morgan, Uber, and the chairman of Ford, bowed out of the event due to mounting questions about the Saudi government's role in the killing. Kelly Smoot, Current News. There's a lot more news headed your way. That important Vatican summit to better connect young people with the church is nearing its conclusion. John Allen joins us next to dig into what's been accomplished so far. The mysterious polio-like illness that is believed to have crippled children is increasing the new numbers and a mother who's coping with the disease. The hero who risked his life to prevent a massacre finally returns to the crime scene and opens up his heart. Do you have a story idea? Something happening in your parish we should know about? We want to hear from you. Keep this email handy, news tips at desalesmedia.org. We will be right back. The leader of America's bishops, Cardinal Daniel DiNardo, is calling the Young People's Synod a success so far, and he says the youth are the best part of the summit. I think young people themselves are some of the greatest peer ministers we can find. When they speak about Jesus because of their encounter, that has a resonance uh, of witness that we may not necessarily have. Cardinal DiNardo added that hearing a young person's story of faith is probably one of the most effective ways to evangelize other young people. The Summit on the Church and Young People is in its final week. The editor of Crux, John Allen, has been leading a team in Rome providing exclusive coverage of the Synod. He joins us now. John, thanks to you guys, we have not missed a single important moment. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Liz. Always a pleasure to be with you. Well, John, as you know, the bishops have discussed a variety of topics, from the clerical sex abuse scandal to women's leadership in the church. We're nearing the next part of the process, which is writing that final document. What will that look like? Well, actually, Liz, a preliminary draft of the final document was distributed to the bishops taking part in the center today. Not just the bishops, of course, but all the other participants. There are about 260 bishops here, but then there are also religious superiors, both men and women, other experts, and about 35 young people taking part in this experience. They all got a kind of preliminary look uh, at that much anticipated final document today. In broad strokes, Liz, it does not contain any major surprises. It basically reflects the tenor of discussions that have taken place in the Senate. So, for instance, there is language on the clerical sexual abuse scandals, but nothing I think anybody who has been following this story will find particularly groundbreaking. It's just a forceful and clear acknowledgement of the gravity uh, of the crisis. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> there is language about women, uh, mostly calling for further reflection on this issue, and again, uh, how important it is. You have to remember that a synod brings together people from all over the Catholic world. So there was, there was always a kind of, you know, search for the lowest common denominator in these final documents that will support consensus across culture and perspective. Now, John, the final document is going to be presented on Saturday, then the bishops will vote on it. As I ask you every time I interview you, what happens next? Where do we go from here? Well, as with every one of these kinds of big Vatican events, whether it's a World Youth Day or a World Meeting of Families or a Senate of Bishops, 
Where we go from here really doesn't depend on Rome, Liz. It depends on the local church. Hmm. Uh, you know, if a particular bishop set through this experience, picked up some creative ideas about how to reach up to young people and goes back home determined to implement them in his diocese, that could change a great deal. Uh, if another bishop uh, didn't find anything particularly useful here, uh, sort of set through it uh, and then catches his flight home and nothing changes in terms of business as usual, then it won't mean a lot. I mean, look, you know, the, the Vatican is very useful for generating ideas. The application of those ideas, however, depends on the grassroots. And for that, we're just going to have to wait and see what happens once these guys go home. John, before I let you go, let's talk about one of those ideas. This is the third synod under Francis' papacy. The first two focused on the family. This one, as you've mentioned, emphasized the youth. How will the bishops move that forward in that regard, connecting the youth to the church? Well, look, Liz, I think if you ask anybody who has taken part of this synod, they will tell you the number one thing that has struck them is how much difference it makes having those 35 young people from all over the world actually inside the Senate hall, uh, you know, taking part in the discussions in the Senate, taking part in the small working groups, uh, participating as full equals. I mean, my sense, Liz, would be that the kind of revolution here is that up to this point, bishops have been talking about young people. What this Senate has given them is a model of how to talk with young people, how to, how to involve them as protagonists uh, in these kinds of conversations. Uh, I think it would be a rare bishop who wouldn't want to go home and apply that uh, in his own backyard. And if that happens on a kind of systematic basis, uh, you know, we could be watching the birth of an entirely new model of what ministry to young adults looks like. John, always a pleasure. I look forward to the next time, sir. Thank you, Liz. There's another spike in cases of a polio-like illness that is paralyzing children and has doctors stumped. Tonight, a devastated mother whose daughter is suffering from the disease is sharing her story. Elizabeth Cohen reports. Abigail Palacios was a healthy, active two-year-old. <coughs> then suddenly, paralyzed from the neck down, a ventilator breathing for her. She had a double ear infection. Um, <laughs> and a really high fever of 103. Then a few days went by and um, she woke up and her arm was completely paralyzed, randomly. And the night before, she was using it just a few hours before. The diagnosis, acute flaccid myelitis, or AFM. The first thing I said was, what is that? It's very similar to a disease from long ago, polio. Like polio, AFM is thought to be caused by a virus but no one knows what virus and why it affects different children differently. Push, push. Oh, such a good job. Can you get those stickers? For example, Abigail's siblings were sick at the same time she was, but they were never paralyzed. Across the country, the CDC reports 62 confirmed cases of AFM in 22 states and 93 possible cases. In an outbreak in 2014, there were 120 confirmed cases. In 2016, 149 cases. No parent should ever have to experience that. And it, what makes it worse is not the tubes, it's not the treatments. What makes it worse is not knowing what caused it. Princess Snow White needs to be picked up. It's hard to know how Abigail will do in the future, if she'll ever be able to walk again on her own. Good job, baby girl. And notice that she still doesn't use her left arm, and her right arm is weak. Thank you. We don't know a lot about the long-term prognosis of AFM right now. That's something that we're still really learning about. Oh, Abigail has actually made great progress in overcoming the disease, but that's not always the case for kids with AFM. Some are still in wheelchairs, paralyzed below the neck with a ventilator breathing for them. The opioid epidemic is decreasing, but deaths from a different drug are on the rise. According to the CDC, between 2017 and 2018, there were more than 14,000 cocaine overdoses. That's a 22% increase from the prior year. Meantime, opioid overdoses have gone down 2.7%. Researchers say that opioids, opioids, that is, could still be contributing to the rise in cocaine overdoses as users may be ingesting cocaine laced with other substances. 
He's been called a hero after stopping a shooter at a Tennessee Waffle House. That was six months ago. James Shaw Jr. has not been able to return to that restaurant until now. What did he find there this time? Love. The last time James visited this Waffle House, these four crosses weren't outside. As soon as I stepped on here, everything started coming back. In April, Shaw disarmed a mass shooter who shot six people, killing four. This is my first time being back at a Waffle House since. I figured that I'd tackle this beast um, on the day of today, the six month anniversary, because it, it means a lot to not only the families, but me too. Shaw placed flowers at each cross. He put a message in balloons. The O comes out of groves, the V comes out of the silver. A letter from each of the victims' last names spelling love. Because there still are four individuals, unfortunately, that didn't go home that night, and uh, we want to remember their legacy. Remembering lives lost. Are you James? I just want to shake your hand, dude. But thank you so much. No I mean, problem. I'm Annie, I was born and raised, so I appreciate you a lot as people remember Shaw's heroics that saved their lives. I wish their families peace. Uh, I pray for their families, and um, I just don't want to see this happen again. In the months since the shooting, Shaw has established a foundation. Its purpose is to rally communities and help halt violence. Still to come on Currents News, fashion for seniors. Catholic charities pitching in to get the ladies consultations about style from a big name store. And speaking of big, tonight's Mega Millions drawing is for an enormous jackpot and Brooklynites have lotto fever. How many tickets did you buy? Five tickets. You bought five tickets? Why'd you buy five? Uh, better, more of a chance to win. <laughs> That's a lot of money. Some seniors in Brooklyn Heights got a special treat this morning. Hey, everybody. Hey. Catholic Charities rewarded the women from the St. Charles Jubilee Center with a free and Taylor Loft style consultation. The lovely ladies enjoyed a light breakfast before the store opened to the public and were then assisted by sales reps who shared fashion tips with the seniors. Who wants to be a billionaire? Well, then you better run out and buy a Mega Millions ticket. The jackpot is now $1.6 billion, the largest prize ever awarded in the nation's history. Earlier today, we caught up with Brooklynites who are fantasizing about what they would do if they hit all the numbers. Many actually felt charitable. We thought we might get on an airplane and we might go and um, fly over Puerto Rico and drop you know, maybe a million over Puerto Rico. Maybe a million over, um, you know, down south of flooding. At my age, I would probably give most of it away to people that I've, you know, family, friends, people that need it. Mm -hmm. Because I don't think I'm going to last that long to, <laughs> to, to spend it all now. Would you ever consider giving it to charity? A lot of charity, sure. Mm -hmm. But they say charity begins at home, right? Yeah, climate change, environmental issues, education. Um, I'd open some soup kitchens. Yeah, do a lot of stuff. You can do anything. I like that. Spread love the Brooklyn way. That is Currents News. I'm Liz Fablis. Thank you so much for joining us because we are putting your faith in the news. Hope to see you again next time.